So one of the things that I noticed about the textbook is something that Kirtney mentioned. The textbook does not number, and this is one criticism I have of the textbook and why I'm seriously considering just writing my own textbooks going into next year. I think I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to do my own open source textbooks like the UVI library is doing for some faculty where you write your own textbook and people just go online and there's no cost for it, right? Um, here's what I did for the resources link, right? See the resources, it has the Zoom link, but it also has resources, right? Maybe what I should do is rename this resources and Zoom link because it's really the first item here All right, the first link is a listing of chapters. So when you're looking at getting started, core infrastructure, this kind of thing. Uh, now you notice the reference to 2019, that's because the textbook changed and was updated just as the year was coming to a close. So what I need to do is check to make sure these are still the same uh, chapters. But basically we had that same problem with the previous version. Courtney, do you know if you have a 2019 or 2022? Because if you could have purchased the one from the bookstore, it would have been the 2019 edition. That's what they would have had on in stock. It's still pretty much the same book. Do you know if yours is 2019 or 2022? The textbook's name is Three Simple Pieces, right? Oh, okay. So yeah, let's talk about that. In the study guide, I talk about an alternate resource and the three easy pieces. That was what we were supposed to study for the exam, right? You were supposed to read just one section of it. So if you go into the references and then you look at the uh, study guide, the study guide was updated uh, a time or two, but we talked about uh, the first three short chapters. Uh, we're talking about five or six pages. So if you go uh, to, if you, yeah, if you go to the link for our Passy Do So, um, basically, it's this. Uh, I think I showed you this before, right? I have three easy pieces. The thing was more really the pages. I just didn't really know where the um where the chapters were at first. It's really messy to find it, especially considering it doesn't have a simple chapter table of contents. Right. Well, this is the free version. So they, they have a hard copy version uh, and it, it was used for other operating system courses previously. But uh, for this course, it's just an extra reference for certain things. And here's a short dialogue. It's like a short play. It's a page or so long. And then the introduction is a couple of pages and then another dialogue. And it talks about virtualization. And that's, that's the only reference that we had listed. Now, in the very first version of the study guide, I had, I had more content listed. But when I updated the study guide, uh, I focused more on the textbook from from our syllabus right which is the windows server uh 2019 third edition actually yeah all right so it does say 2019 but it's in the third edition there's a 2022 server reference that's related that just came out so my my apologies for being and I'm, that I only focused on three easy pieces. I never even bothered to even get a chance to really read this book much. Okay. Well, as long as you follow the study guide and um, let's see, was there, was there an addendum? Did I, did I have a supplement to the study guide? I did. So I had a study guide addendum and it was about installation types, right? Does this look familiar? Is 
I said, talked about common methods of setup, right? We talked about some of this in class. Talked about booting over a network and, uh, okay. Why don't we go over the assessment? And, and then um, if you find that there's a question on the assessment that's not at all in here or in here, then I will gladly drop the assessment item from the assessment. And then we'll rescore everyone's results, okay? Fair enough? Okay. Okay, because I mean, there were some changes and we were updating content and, and I could have, this is another reason why we do the item analysis. So if we find out there's a problem question or, or you know, there was a mistake on my side, I drop it from the assessment and then all of the scores are, are uh, recalculated automatically. And then people end up with a, you know, a different score. So that is always available to you as an option. And what I'm going to do here is um, increase the size so that it's a little more legible. What I'd like to do though, is go into here and look at our item analysis to see uh, how, how everyone did. So yeah, this, this was a pretty tough assessment and for everyone's first attempt, uh, the average score was two out of a possible five, right? So that would be like a 40%. And that means that, uh, that there were some, a number of items where students uh, struggled. But you see that we did have one easy question, four hard questions and 12 medium questions based on the content. And, um, and then these mean that either everybody got them correct or everybody got them wrong. So that's not it, but it was a 60 minute assessment. And, and this is one thing I brought up in another class. Uh, you had 60 minutes to take the, the assessment, right? And uh, the average time that students took to engage this was just half the time. And considering it was open book, I got the impression that people may have been rushed. They may have been doing it, you know, I mean, maybe the timing was bad and so people had to rush. Uh, the good news is we can reconcile our errors and we'll put another version of this online, a similar version, and you get to retake this. So uh, that's, again, that's one more reason why we uh, do what we do. I'm gonna go ahead and sort this uh, based on the highest scores versus the uh, lowest scores and we'll work our way down. So at the bottom of the assessment items, we had some assessment items that were worth a half a point and um, most students got most of that correct because uh, you know it was a possible 0.5 and the average score was a 0.38 so most of the answers selected were correct uh, for this multiple choice item uh, it's worth a quarter of a point and the average score was a quarter of a point which means all students got this item correct completely but this multiple answer, which is worth a half a point, um, a little more than half got correct answers. So what we'll do is we'll run down the list um, and we'll review each of the items. So our first assessment item reads, you are to set up the hardware components for a workgroup server using current recommendations for such a system. You are told this will not be a physical system, rather a virtual system. Well, in your, let's look in here, in your study guide, let's see, where are we? Hold up, now I'm in the wrong place. There we go, sorry about that, give me a sec.
in your study guide, there is a table that talks about what the customary hardware resources are involved, right? It's further down in the, it's right here, okay? Does this look familiar to everyone? Okay, so these are the general physical and virtual hardware requirements. So basically, if you have a physical server that you're gonna set up with an operating system, and it's gonna be a gaming server or a media server, if it's a physical server, you should use eight gigs of RAM, 160 gigs of non-RAID hard drive, and a standard gigabit ethernet card. Now, I'm sure a lot of gamers would argue with that, but I'm just talking about a server that hosts a network game, not a high performance workstation that participates in the game. Everybody understand that? Yes. Okay, all right. A work group server. You have a small office and you have four to six people. That's a work group, right? Six, eight people, max. That's a 16, to do a server for that, you would do 16 gigs of RAM. You would have a 320 gigabyte hard drive that's configured in a RAID 1, meaning there's redundant disks. You have a pair of disks that work in tandem. That way they're redundant. RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent or Inexpensive Disks. You would have dual gigabit ethernet because you have six to eight people. If one of your ethernet cords goes bad, you don't want everybody dead in the water. If one of your hard disks go bad, you don't want six to eight people dead in the water. Does this make sense? Kind of, sort of. Okay. When you talk about a mid-sized organization, you're doing something called network load balancing. You're using larger. The point is, is if you go physical, this is, you just read down the list. So we describe what it is it's doing. And then these are the hardware specifications required. But if it's virtual, it takes half as much. Okay. So a basic rule of thumb is that virtual server requirements are roughly half what a physical server would require, except for the network bandwidth, okay? That would remain the same. So that's where the answer to this question came from. Uh, are there any questions for this item? Hello. So it says workgroup server, a workgroup server uses 16 and 320, but it's a virtual machine. So instead of 16 and 320, it's 8 and 160. Okay. That's how we get that answer. Another reason why virtual machines are so popular is they take less, they make better use of resources. So it takes less resources to run them. This is really important. Okay. All right, the next question that posed a challenge for students reads, you need a highly specialized operating system to use for a web server. And, it, and the operating system has to be available at no cost. But you would like affordable professional support included as a part of the platform. So the operating system itself doesn't cost anything, but you want to purchase support. We're talking about a version of Linux. And in order to own Red Hat Linux, you have to buy a support contract, which is relatively affordable. And that's the one version of Linux where you can, even though the license is free, there's no cost for the Linux that you load. In order to buy that, in order to obtain that install media, you have to have that support contract. And the good news is if something goes wrong, you get professional support this is the one the US government, this is the one that a lot of international organizations, Fortune 500 companies, a lot of commercial organizations shy away from Linux because you can't get support. But if they do run Linux, they love Red Hat. It's often called RHEL. You'll see references to this online. It'll say, it'll say oh, you have a big company, they're running RHEL. They're talking about running Linux and it's free and they get support, but they, they don't pay nearly as much for the support as they would if they were doing Windows, right? Windows is a lot more expensive. Any questions? 
Now, where is that in your study guide? Uh, it talks about Linux, I think. Red Hat, wait a minute. Well, let's. I thought we had that in. Thought we had that in one of our diagrams and slides that we shared. Um, when we were talking about market interests and Red Hat, all right, it wasn't in the study guide, but it was in. Was in one of these. Uh, we went over Does this look familiar to people? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. We talked about the roles and how it sits in between. And then there was another one that had to do with um OS and mm, it's in one of the folders. I I know it's in I know it's inside the references or resources folder, but it shows which operating systems to pick for which conditions. So uh, let's find that. Because I don't want you to take my word for it. Uh, hold on. No, that's not where I wanted to go. I wanted to go into here. No, wasn't in here. It was in here. Software hash solution images. Let's build. You know, um, I'm going to go back and look, and we may drop that question. There was supposed to be something in there that showed it was an extra. Uh, reference that showed which which versions were good for which solutions. We we did talk about CentOS and it being used for web servers and it's free. Yes, we talked about. Does anyone remember CentOS? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to find that reference and Courtney. I've heard. I've heard your concerns. And as we go through this, we'll figure out if there are any more like this, but I'll I'll drop this question, okay? Unless I can unless I can find it plainly. I thought I had that all together in the and the resources. So I took the content from last season and ported it over to this season, and all of it should have all of it should have come across. And um, everybody does know that you're when you're getting ready for the assessment, you're supposed to review what's in the resources folder, but you really want to spend most of your time looking at the references, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's get back into our item analysis. So this was a question where students, this is a multi-answer question. And uh, the question reads, which method of Windows operating system install is considered a best practice for a given scenario? And when we said it's a single system, if you, if you wipe the hard drive clean and start with install media and load Typically now it's USB. It used to be a DVD disc. You would burn a DVD disc using an ISO. You'd have to get software to burn a disc. 
and you could load Windows. Nobody does that anymore. We use USB drives. But you create a USB media uh, install media with a spare USB drive that's 16 gigs or larger, and you wipe the system clean if it's a single system. Now, if you have multiple systems, the preferred way is to do uh, a template, like a, an ideal setup for a system, and then you, you capture that image after you run sysprep and you do a network PXE install, a PIXI install for multiple systems. That's the automated, fastest, most, most efficient method. I know we covered this in class. Any questions about this one? No, no question. Okay. Now, the feature, the feature update uses a new version of Windows, but it loads it over the old version. If you buy a new version from a qualified vendor like Office Max and load it, you're loading a new version of the operating system on top of the old version. So both of those are not considered the best way to, to load Windows, okay? And system recovery and reset is not reloading the operating system. It's not installing the operating system, it's simply resetting or refreshing the operating system. So if it's flawed, you're not, you're not I mean, it helps, and sometimes it solves a problem, but a lot of times it doesn't. Any questions about this one? All right. Custom server, right? So the question reads, a server requires hardware components that are custom designed. So we're talking about a machine that would typically fulfill the role of a server, not a client operating system or a consumer grade operating system, but something for a bigger machine that supports multiple users. It requires hardware components that are custom designed for systems with simultaneous users. Select the item below that represents a custom server hardware components and uh, error correction RAM, there's a special kind of RAM called ECC RAM or buffered RAM. So is everybody familiar with DDR4 RAM? The kind that goes in gaming, gaming systems? Yes, no, maybe. And RAID. So if we look in our study guide, Uh, it talks about RAID, part of Nazareth SAN. Let's see if there's something in here about memory. Yeah, I thought there was a reference in there about uh, server memory. So uh, again, that's a, a question that we'll take another look at. And my apology. Um, let's keep going. We want to get as far with this as possible. So I'll do the same with this question. Uh, unless I can find a, a, a reference to ECC RAM. Um, So the 80-20 rule is an important method used in the design of all operating systems. We didn't talk about this uh, in class specifically. Uh, I think we covered this in previous, in previous semesters and other courses. There's this rule called the 80-20 rule. So essentially what they, efficiency experts found out that 80% that of the time you use 20% of the features or 20% of the resources. 
uh, take a household toolbox, for example. If you, in your toolbox, you have a whole variety of tools. Let's just pretend that each of you have your own toolbox in your home and you have a, a, an adjustable wrench, you have a pair of pliers, you have some screwdrivers, you have some socket wrenches, you, you have a, a variety of different tools, right? And what, what efficiency experts have found out is that regardless of what kind of work it is, that 80% of the time, a person is only really using 20% of the tools or 20% of the resources, 20% of the available features, right? 20% of the available features are used 80% of the time. So when it comes to an operating systems design, an operating system will cache or prefetch the data to optimize that information so that the CPU can get quicker access to it. That, that's what this part of our uh, study guide talks about. Are there any questions about this? Oh. <clears throat> okay. And I think that was a true false extra credit item i think so if you got that right if you didn't get it right it didn't cost you it was it was false right it was it said uh 80 20 rule is an important method used in the design of all operating systems it's false because um wait a minute now oh well, that would be Oh, I'm glad you called that out. In most in most operating systems, uh, it is a design rule. Um, there are cases for very high security, like we have some that have to be really high high security operating systems where the 80-20 rule doesn't really matter. Um, for operating systems that are designed for ease of use, or for extensibility, the 80-20 rule applies. But when it comes to efficiency, like, like a very high security version of Linux, um, th that would be an exception. But most of the time it is used in the design for operating systems. And I think that question should read true. Uh, so, so if you got credit for it, I'm not going to take it away. But if you lost credit, I'll go in there and I'll change it so that you get credit for that because it should be true. Um, I'm beginning to wonder if I got the right test or the right version of the study guide because uh, we've run into a number of uh, issues here. Um, and this is a higher number than normal. Let's keep going. And then when we get to the end of our class, we'll make a decision about this, okay? So once again, this is one reason why we do item analysis. So if we run into a snag, we, we can work through it. All right, uh, the importance of persistence. This is, the question reads, it's multiple choice. Persistence is an important function in any OS because when you power off the system, all data is lost from system memory. So RAM empties out. Random access memory disappears. The data that's stored in RAM evaporates, it vanishes. And the reason you need persistence is because when you power off a system, you have to have a way of storing the data. And that is the correct answer here. Um, students answered when powered on a multitasking system requires storage of active services. Uh, that's a tricky that's a tricky answer because active services are active services are stored in RAM. And, and RAM is not, has nothing to do with persistence. RAM is volatile memory. And so you would not want to answer this one because when you're talking about active services, you're talking about things that are running in RAM. And um, 
Oftentimes, what's running in RAM does not require storage. It all depends on the service. Some services just handle traffic. Um, you know, here, here's your DNS entry. Here's, you know, here's the here's where you find the gateway. It is just incidental to a situation, but when you power it off, it's not like uh, that's required. So, I hope that explains this question. Any concerns or questions yet about this item? No, no question. Okay. So when you see stuff about active services, that's RAM and that's volatile, not persistent memory. That's why that one doesn't, doesn't work. Courtney, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it says, which edition of server 2019 provides all the essential resources for a small professional practice or business? up to two dozen systems and 50 users. Essentials. There's a special version, there's a standard edition and there's a data center edition, but there's a third version called Essentials. And I think that's, uh, you know, I'm gonna know whether or not I have the wrong study guide or assessment or both, if I don't see this in here. Everybody see this? Yes, we see. So the only additions that have been available since server 2016 are essentials, standard, and data center. And that's still true today, even with 2022. Um, they Microsoft will plan on discontinuing essentials when they roll out the rest of 2022. They've already announced that, you know what, they're giving away too much. So for a small office uh, with two dozen users and 50 clients, um, Essentials works really well and it has everything you need to start an Active Directory domain. Um, and I know that uh, as, this, as the versions have rolled out, they've retained Essentials, but they did announce that they were considering dropping this version or edition uh, when 2022 came out. And uh, I'll check on that, but anyway, any questions about this item? So this multiple choice item reads, which essential OS function is associated with multitasking? That would be concurrence. Persistence has to do with hard disk storage that's retained after the power is turned off. Um, abstraction and resource management are roles that they perform, but not, not a function. So an operating system's role is to abstract resources and uh, to, to basically provide resource management. So those are the two roles that an OS um, is designed to handle. But when it comes to primary functions, you have concurrence, persistence, and virtualization, right? So it's concurrence that does that. Any questions about this item? Now, when we talk about operating system roles, deployment roles are different than generic operating system roles. So Microsoft has a series of, you know, Microsoft wants to sell one server operating system and you choose what role it will fulfill when it's deployed. So in some cases, a server will be a file server. In other cases, it will be a, a network server. It'll do DHCP and DNS. In, in yet other cases, it'll be a database server or an application server, an email server, a web server. And one of the most common roles is the one that's used for websites. Internet information server is the deployment role that Microsoft uses for, it's called IIS. And that's when you, so you install the operating system and then you deploy it to fulfill a given purpose. 
That's what's called a deployment role. So if you have a lot of domains that people need, a lot of times uh, people use Google for their domain name service, but you can create that deployment role and run your own DNS server. And then if your internet service provider fails, you, you keep working on the internet. That's a really cool thing. Let me say that again. If you have Windows operating system set up and you choose to run DNS as a deployment role, there's very little overhead associated with it. But if your internet service fails and you can't browse the internet, you can't browse the web or do email, your own domain server, your own domain name server will perform what your internet service provider doesn't. So half the time you're, what am I saying? Half the time the ISP fails, your internet service provider fails on the island. Uh, if you have this running, you don't. You keep right on working on your internet. And you, you smile while everybody else is dead in the water. That's cool. And you're going to build one of those before uh, our next module, before our next module solution. You're going to create one of those. It's just that cool. But Internet Information Server is the web server. Any questions about this item and what a deployment role is? And deployment roles were in your, in your study guide. So if I look at this, uh, deployment roles. Yeah. Um, we talk about deployment roles and then there's a link. Uh, there should be a link when you get to this part. And there is uh, something about where, hey, so if you click this, it tells you all the different uh, deployment roles. And did everybody see this? Hello? Yeah, we see it. OK. Um, for the longest time, uh, Microsoft came out with a release two of a version. So 2003 had a release two, 2008 had a release two, 2012 had a release two, but 2016 actually did not. Uh, many people said 2019 is supposed to be 2016 R2, but Microsoft took a lot of criticism for having a second release. So they waited an extra year and they came out with 2019. They said, no, it's a whole new version of the operating system. It's not, it's not a second release of the same operating system. It's so new and improved. It's a whole new operating system. It was all marketing crap. That's really all it was. 2019 was supposed to be called release two. Uh, 2016, if they had continued the same pattern from 2003, right? 2003 release two, 2008 release two, 2012 release two. A lot of people were saying, don't install anything unless it's a release two, because they get they got a lot of the bugs out. Whenever they came out with the second release, a lot of the problems were fixed. This is common for Linux. It's the even numbered releases that are better than the odd number releases. Okay. We, we did mention some about that in class one time, right? At least, even in odd versions of Linux, R2, that kind of stuff, something. Does that ring a bell at all? Okay. Uh, this will be the last item that we cover, but when we come back on Wednesday, I'm gonna recap the problem questions. In the meantime, I'd like you to reconcile your errors, even though there were some questions that you'll receive credit for. Um, and that's because uh, if we did not explicitly cover it or there was an edited version of the study guide that did not include material for that, then we need to have an addendum. So when we close out the module, we've got all the complete information. Um, what am I saying? I won't hold any questions that were not referenced in the study guide against you. Um, but if it's 
in this assessment, uh, for, for one reason or another, uh, there might have been a version issue with the study guide. And, and I'm going to I'm going to put out. I'm going to add to the addendum to make sure that information is in there. So as you retake your final assessment for module one, that information will be in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. OK, all right. I'm more concerned with you having the complete information and having the full scope of knowledge that's important. And if there, if there are some gaps, that's why we do this item analysis, right? We want, we want you to have a very solid foundation of the essential information that you need to be successful when you're working with operating systems. Okay. Um, it's now three o'clock. So what I'm gonna do is uh, stop here and we can finish reviewing some other items, but I'll go ahead and post the, reconciliation. And um, if you have any other questions or concerns, uh, feel free to uh, send me a text message or an email that says, hey, you want to talk about this some more. But we'll we'll uh, go ahead and review some more on Wednesday, and, and then we'll see what we need to do about uh, the assessment and revising some of the material. Okay. Thank you for your Thank you for being here today. And uh, unless there are any final questions, I I'm going to close out this session. Okay. Okay. Bye, Dr. Kendall. Bye. Right. Okay. okay. Bye bye for now.